So welcome back to the Wisdom Factory, the English edition again. I'm Heidi from thewisdomfactory.net and I'm here in Italy. It's still nice weather, warm, as you can see, but winter won't be too long and I hope it will be better this year than last year. Anyway, we are all over the world and today our guest is Mike, Mike, oh, Luke. Luke Healy. <laughs> I Luke, uh, what I yeah, I'm so sorry. And he is uh, over the pond on the other side of the world. <laughs> and he has created the Integral Christian Network. And I'm very interested in this. And so we decided to talk together with the title Rediscovering Christianity and Stepping into an Integral Perspective because maybe we need this perspective to revive our culture and our religion. But before we talk, I would like that you introduce yourself, not Mike, but Luke, <laughs> and say some words about you. Yeah, thanks Heidi, it's great to be here. I'm Luke Healy, um, and yeah, like Heidi said, I've started the, co-founded the Integral Christian Network with Paul Smith, who's the author of Integral Christianity and a couple other books. And we've been working to gather integral Christians and to try and evolve our perspective on what it looks like to um, be a Christian and to uh, see that in a more evolved way and how we can uh, carry forward uh, into the 21st century um, a more evolved form of Christianity. And so uh, my heart is just, I'm, I'm a gatherer, I'm an innovator, I know that we need new forms, we need to bring people together, we need to experiment, we need to co-create, and we need emergence. So that's my passion, and so that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I, I'm glad that I met you, because, you know, I think in the private discussion we had, a conversation, I told you that I was brought up Christian, Protest, Protestant, Lutheran, mm -hmm. but, you know, I didn't like the way the, the, the priest was. It was really, uh. and so as soon as I could, I went out of the church and even left the church completely, you know? And then as a singer and choir master, I happened to come back to the church as a choir master and went there and um, yeah, I did the choir thing, but I never really participated because Christianity, it was like, oh yeah, no, no it's not for me. At the same time, I realized that many of the integral people, especially, went to Buddhism. And they thought it was, and many friends I have, they talked about Buddhist concepts as if it was natural and normal. And I said, oh, what is that? I didn't know. I learned a little bit during the years. But I thought for me, Buddhism would never be really, no, that's another culture. That's not our culture. Our culture is Christian. And so there was the big gap to feel part of the Christian heritage, let's say. And I know that's in me, but I couldn't, I couldn't really approach the Christian churches. churches you know, I, I, I found it absolutely impossible. And um, yeah, and I have to confess, I didn't uh, read uh, this book, Christ, uh, Integral Christianity, because I'm not liking so much reading, but I came across uh, Jordan Peterson and his uh, biblical lectures, and he opened up my view on Christianity, on the Bible again. Uh, I mean, I didn't read it actually, but I had it interpreted and that made so much sense to me. And so I am very much now interested in discovering what Christianity is, but not from the perspective of a traditional church, as it was the only possibility so far, let's say, but from an integral perspective. And I have to say before we start that in uh, Germany, there are uh, attempts uh, to, do, to do that. I have it here. God 9.0, uh, Christian Macher, uh, that's now also in English. The new book is uh, Integral Christ Christianity, and I started to read it. It's, it's very nice. It's mainly on spiral dynamics now, the, the levels of development. So I'm beginning to enter into a perspective that I want to 
appropriate myself of my heritage, spiritual heritage. And so I'm very, very grateful that you are doing this work. And now I'm curious what you are doing. <laughs> A long introduction, but now everything to you. No, there's so much there. There's so much there we could talk about. I mean, just kind of, yeah, what are we talking about when we talk about Christianity and and the cultural heritage and the, the kind of the native tongue that we've been brought up in, um, or we could go down into, um, yeah, the expressions that that takes at the traditional level. And I grew up in that space as well and had my own frustrations and left the church. And um, and then, yeah, the, the integral perspective that that is uh, often soaked in a Buddhist spirituality, which has many wonderful things, many, many good things to learn. Um, but there's also some things from from the Christian spiritual tradition that we uh, can definitely learn from as well and and uh, explore, which is which is sort of what we're doing in some ways. Um, and then there's there's kind of the stages of, of how that evolves and looks in different forms. So I'm game to to go down any of those any of those pathways. So what's what's grabbing you? Oh, I lost your audio. I think you're muted. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. What I'm interested in is uh, how the change came for you, that you got interested so much that you now are doing what you are doing, this uh, integral Christian network. I mean, this is quite a step from going out of church, traditional church, and taking on the topic again. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I mean, when I say I, I went out of church, I went out of the form. I went out of traditional Christianity. And Fortunately, I think for me, I had had some, some re really profound experiences that, that rooted me in a connection to the divine expression of God in Christian terms as I understood it. So those experiences kind of rooted me in, in, a, in a knowledge and an understanding that there's something real here. There's something very important. And so even as I deconstructed, even as I evolved, I still kind of had that center um, to carry me through. And, and <clears throat> not everyone has that, and it's not necessary, but... Um, but for me, uh, what happened to me as I, as I just kind of went through growing up and, uh, and learning more about the world and seeing the kind of the narrow perspective that, that I experienced um, in my childhood religion and, and kind of expanding beyond that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of went through it uh, mostly in forms. Like I, I put my frustration onto the structures. I put my frustration onto well, you know, I don't think, I don't think it, what the problem isn't the message as much as it is the way that we're doing it. Like, like, why is this guy up there talking to everyone in all these rows? And why, why are we, why are we doing this, that, and the other? And so, so I kind of went through a journey of forms and, and tried to look at different ways to do church and, and gather people spiritually and house churches and missional churches and all these different movements and, and, and led into forming a, an intentional community uh, and, and living in that for five years, uh, which was quite an experience, and also furthered my my evolutionary journey, um, that led me to to kind of an ego death experience, a, a death of my spiritual ego, and uh, and kind of coming through that after many years, uh, integral perspective really just gave me a, a map to see where I'd been and what I'd gone through, and it just illuminated everything. Oh, it makes sense, you know. A lot maybe other people say this, but the flat land became became dynamic and I could see where it all happened. And, um, and then in my own experience of kind of living that out and, and kind of trying to walk more into that integral perspective and that those integral values and, and feeling those emerge in me, um, there's a definite loneliness and kind of an isolation. And even some people who maybe understood parts of it, uh, didn't get other parts or, um, you know, a lot of my old friends or people I grew up with, thought I was kind of crazy or whatever. So um, yeah, I met Paul Smith. Uh, I sought him out. We actually live in the same city. I grew up in that city, but I wasn't ready to meet him when I was younger. Um, and, and you know, we just had a beautiful conversation and connected and, and we kind of ended up on this spot of loneliness and, and how we're so isolated from people who share our values and, and kind of see the world this way. And, and I just said, you know, what if we don't have to be so lonely? Like, what if we, what if we try to gather people, you know, now, now we have the internet, we have Zoom, we have these, these technologies that weren't around five or 10 years ago. So 
it's becoming more possible and the, the means and the methods are, are filling in. So that just kind of connected into my gathering archetype that I've embraced and, and trying to bring people together, um, really valuing community and, um, yeah, the, the need for co-creation, the need for a collective form to, to, to further the work of evolution and to continue along those lines. So when you do this uh, gathering, when you started out, did you especially think about people who are interested in integral or just, just finding people with whom you could talk about the religious things? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we kind of started with integral. We, Really, really what we did is <laughs> we started as we compiled the list of everyone who had sent Paul an email over the last 10 or 15 years <laughs> saying, oh, I love, you know, this integral Christianity, this is what I've been looking for. This is, you know, the expression, is there anyone else out there doing this? He had so many emails like that. So, so we just, just kind of gathered a list. Um, I was also a part of the uh, the Living School at the Center for Action and Contemplation, which is Richard Rohr's um, school and organization. And there are a lot of um, progressive Christians in that space and, and, and non-Christians as well, people from other traditions and religions. Um, but there was also, there was also uh, some missing pieces there that people were really, really craving after. And, and they teach integral theory. They, they, they you know, teach Ken Wilber. So, um, so there was some knowledge there. Uh, so that's where we started from, but I think um, in the gathering sense, I don't want to just limit people to to who have a conceptual understanding of integral theory, but people who are in that place where they're feeling a, a, a drawing or an inclination toward a higher stage, right? Maybe they're kind of disillusioned with postmodernism. They're tired of being so reactive. They're tired of... Um, you know, just, just that space that, that can be really volatile and difficult and, and the, maybe they're ready for something more. So sometimes the perspective comes first, sometimes the, the experience comes first and then the perspective can illuminate that like it did for me. So. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a common experience for people who uh, find the integral map that uh, they feel quite alone because uh, normally friends and even spouses not necessarily go the same route <laughs> and don't understand what you're talking about. And actually that's sort of that I got to know you, no? because I, there was an integral life, the, the threat by Ryan Lacade, who yeah. said, it's long at the top. And I said, why not meet on Zoom? And so we started this chat, yeah. um, these chats on Zoom, which are not specifically, not necessarily uh, spe on specific topics, while you are uh, connecting people on Christianity. And so I'm now interested how you do that. And, uh, you know, just how you start, and then we see. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and, and yeah, there's, there's a definite purpose to to drawing around the, the Christian framework and, and that gives us a common tongue that gives us experiences that we can relate to that that gives a shape and a form to our evolving and and um, you know like I kind of referenced before about experiences I think um, the growing up is happens best when it comes with waking up when it comes with the experiential side the the spiritual practices uh, that sort of inform our view of, of reality. And, and I, I do think there's a definite synergy that happens with those experiences. So, so right now, when, when we're gathering people, we're doing that in we spaces and we're exploring um, <clears throat> methods of, of spiritual practice together informed by kind of an evolved Christian uh, practice of co-meditation and transmission and praying for one another um, that, that doesn't look much like, like a regular church. <laughs> exactly. I wanted to ask you Christian practices, you know, normally we sing chorus in Lutheran church and we, we sing maybe even a little bit more Bach. I love Bach no, the Bach music, but then the, they read the Bible and then the, you know, the, the priest is telling his ideas of what he thinks that it is about. And, yeah, and you sit there and think, oh, hopefully he finishes soon. And then, you know, it's some other piece of music. And uh, 
when, when it's done by let's, half professional people, it's nice. But when everybody is singing, sometimes you need even to close your ears because you think, oh, uh, okay. And so for me, this sort of uh, ritual was always sort of sufferance. <laughs> So the nice part came afterwards, having coffee together or something, you know. So what is the difference <laughs> in your gatherings? I was just at a conference, a gathering, and they were talking about um, Father Thomas Keating, and he would go to these interfaith gatherings, and, and he was so bored, and he just said, you know, the best times are the break times and the meals. So I, I should just start a conference that's just break times and meals, you know. <laughs> and in some ways, that's that's not exactly what we're doing but it is it's it's you know the challenge is that a lot of the forms and structures if we want to go back to that lower right quadrant um are still coming from a rather traditional uh a traditional stage right so so even trying to evolve those and bring those into a more postmodern stage i mean some are modern the the more some of you might say some of the American mega churches or things like that, but it's still hierarchical. It's still this person talking and everyone else sitting and listening. And um, so, so even evolving those stages to to uh, those forms to a more postmodern perspective is a challenge and, and an area of growth. And then and then you know beyond that into integral um, is an extra leap. And you so anyway, what what we try to do is we we bring people into a space where. Um, there is facilitation, there is leadership, but, but we're actually practicing together. We're valuing the whole group, right? We're trying to enter into collective spiritual practice. You know, you know, I, <laughs> when I went to church, I don't go to church anymore, a traditional church, but I would always think like, like, what are we doing here? Like, why, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this, right? What we're doing. And, um, and I think that's always an important question to ask, especially when we're dealing with tradition and when we're dealing with long-standing traditions. It's like, well, that's the way we've always done it. And there can be beauty in that. There can be wonderful things like 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 amazing church music and some of those things that that I, we would love to include as we transcend the the lesser helpful things. Um, we haven't quite figured out how to get Bach onto Zoom yet, but we're you know the technology will come maybe. <laughs> Uh, but it starts by, you know, for me, it's always like we should be going to church to experience the divine, to cultivate uh, a spiritual practice within us that is leading us into higher consciousness, that is leading us into experience of love and the things that, you know, are talked about and are written about in the Bible. Uh, so, so, you know, our specific form, I'm not trying to dance around it as much as give the support of it. What, what we've started with, at least in these We Space practices, is to value each person. And we're coming in and we start with a meditation, a whole body meditation, right? Not just in our mind, but we're also engaging our hearts um, and our gut space, our gut center uh, of intelligence, which maybe some people are a little less familiar with. We're engaging all of those centers of being into a collective meditation, a co-meditation, right? A lot of meditation or um, meditation is a little more helpful than the word prayer, even though it is a form of prayer. People have other connotations with prayer. But what we're doing is we're entering into a space um, of silence and presence uh, and energy and we're not just focusing on that within us and our own thoughts and our own feelings, but we're taking that into the collective. We're taking that into the shared energy fields of the group. Um, and there's a real palpable experience of that. You know, we do this actually in, in, in real life all the time, right? We enter, walk into a room with a lot of people and there's an energy, right? We can feel like, oh, there's something going on here that's weird or this, you know, but we're not, we're not tuned into that too much. We don't, cultivate that as a practice and, and recognize that there's a spiritual dimension to that as well. So, so that's one level of kind of the subtle field that we're entering into the bioenergetics. Um, also in kind of a high subtle um, forms of, of spiritual guides and the presence of Jesus. So we're, we're entering into that shared collective space. And that's new for a lot of people. That's something that, that you know, you kind of have to experience and grow in as a practice. Some, some people are, are more familiar with that and, and they feel a little more comfortable. Um, so do you do guided meditation? Somebody is, is uh, guiding the group into, is it an imagination or is it all together feeling into the body? What, what is it? Yeah, yeah, good question. We start with some guided meditations the first few times to kind of 
let people get give people a sense of the practice and we're writing about this practice to learn more about it um, and talking about it and teaching on it so um, we start with a guided a guided practice and then uh, over time we move more into a practice that that practice that is more uh, more silent more within um, and then among and, and just felt. And then, and that's just the first half of the group. So the first half of the groups do that. And then we transition into a period of listening to God into a, a transmission where we are trying to step into that space of emergence and co-creation and, and, um, and gaining from the, the subtle field of collective wisdom and intelligence and, and speaking into people's lives and praying for one another in a more evolved form. Um, you are saying listening to God. That sounds interesting. Um, can you say more about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, <clears throat> the word the Bible uses—that's kind of a horrible word that we don't want to use anymore—is prophecy, right? But it, in you know, in the Bible, in the New Testament, there's a lot of of um, recordings of of people, you know, having experiences with the resurrected, living Jesus, and and hearing from God and and, and, you know, that's a long time ago and things are really different now. And, and maybe we think that that's not possible, but, um, but this integral perspective, you know, we're coming from the three faces of God or the three faces of spirit. Um, and as Paul talks and writes about that, right, we have the God out there, the God beyond us, the, the, the God that, that we learn about and that we talk about and we can reflect on and cognitively think about. And that's the God that a lot of us interact with most primarily um, and that's good. That's good. That's part of it, right? The second... That's, that's the God where I say, dear God, help me to get out of this mess. Isn't yeah, that exactly, one? Right? Yeah. And that prayer that we have that, that we maybe did as a child and maybe still do sometimes in, in desperate moments <laughs> and other times too, right? But uh, the second face of God is the personal face of God, right? The one that we experience through our heart. Um, the the one that we can relate to, the, the personal presence. And this is a... This is an, you know, an aspect of Christianity that's a real gift and a real beauty that that maybe uh, is harder to find in Buddhism or some of the other expressions because we have the person of Jesus Christ, because we have the living presence of Jesus and other spiritual guides. Some people have baggage or triggers with Jesus. And so, you know, that's hard to, to relate to. Um, and I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> that can I would like to tell you something about this personal uh, uh, relationship with God. Uh, here nearby, there are nuns, Catholic nuns, uh, and they are taking care for older people. And they have young uh, female nuns, uh, yeah, they are always female, uh, from all over the world. And uh, when I have too much fruit on my trees, I call them. And then they come with their long black uh, uh, gowns, and they uh, just step up the trees and are happy and laughing and really wonderful. And last time there was one, she had not yet this black thing on. And she said, um, yeah, in two months I will be ordained or something. I don't know how it is called in, uh, in, in the church. And uh, I wasn't personally present, but a friend of mine was present when she was introduced to uh, to, to be a nun, and my friend told me that she was guided by her father in the white dress to the altar where she would meet her husband, Jesus. You know, that's a literal uh, relationship with Jesus, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it is, right? Yeah, I know that, and that, that, that a lot of, I've heard of that before with the nuns and this, you're marrying Jesus, right? And, um, you know, the second person of God is, is so beautiful and so wonderful, but also can be really difficult, right? Because if we, if we grew up in a traditional space, you know, it's different for everyone, right? But if we grew up in a traditional church, um, you know, the kind of buddy Jesus, the felt board Jesus, the, you know, Jesus is my friend, uh, can get a little watered down, can get a little pacified. And, 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 you know, some of deconstruction is shedding some of those less than helpful images and, and growth in, in stages. Um, but if we're transcending and including, right, that's something that we want to bring back into our experience. That's something that, that is really powerful and is really good. And, and I, I had to do that. I lost Jesus for a while in, in my process of growing up. And, and when I, when I met Paul and saw his beautiful 
relationship with Jesus and just warm, connective, tender, but also full of strength. Um, you know, it, it gave me a model to, to, to be like, oh yeah, Jesus. Oh, I get Jesus back. And you know, we, we get a lot of people who say that, you know, maybe they, they went over into shamanic expressions or they went into Buddhist or some other form because they needed to find some of the things that that, that traditional expression of Christianity that, that they grew up in was lacking. And then they come back and they're like, oh, oh yeah, Jesus, I love Jesus. Like I want, you know, I get to, I get to have Jesus again. And it's not just like this, this thing that I can't square with intellectually or, you know, um, maybe my values, right? And that is a really beautiful experience that we see happen to a lot of people. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. How, how does it work? How, how does it happen? How, what, how, how does it feel like? What, what is it, this relationship? How do you live it? Yeah, that's good. You know, it's, it is in that, that subtle realm, right? That, that realm of spirit, that realm of, um, of kind of the unseen realities. And a lot of times as Westerners, we're not so practiced in that, right? We, we tend to focus on the concrete and the physical and the scientific and, and science, you know, well, we don't want to go, we don't have to go there, but, um, but, uh, you know, again, in that, in that experience, when we're, when we're growing in this, in that subtle realm, and another word for that subtle realm that some people use is the imaginal. And so it is an act of co-creation. It is something that, that we focus on, that we think about, that we engage in. We have a part in that. That doesn't make it any less real, right? Postmodernism talks about constructivism. And, you know, if you go to the extremes of that, you think everything is constructed, so nothing is real, right? But, but, while that's a, a bit too extreme, there's also some truth in that, right? That we do construct our own reality. We do have a part to play. And, and that's okay. That's the nature of everything. That's, that's how God intends it. And that's also part of the first person face of God, which we'll get to. Um, but, but that act of, of kind of stepping into and engaging with that into the subtle realm, um, there's a part that we play in it. And the more that you do it, the more that you practice it, you start to learn that there are, there are certain things that you engage with or that come to you, right? It's not always our own imagination, our own emergence. I don't want to make it sound like it's only that. And in fact, for me, it's primarily not that. A, a lot of times things come up and you might say, oh, that's just your brain firing, whatever, right? But if we're looking at it from a spiritual perspective, right? Things are coming up and, and it's a presence, it's Jesus or it's, or it's another, another figure or something, or maybe it's just an image or a thought. Um, and you start to learn a flavor or a frequency or a characteristic of these, these things that you're experiencing. Um, you know, some of the less helpful words like prophecy I mentioned before, or maybe psychic, you know, uh, that's, that's usually not a helpful word, but, but, um, but this kind of subtle realm, there, there's, there's, there is a reality there. There is a, you know, I think in the integral world, we, we tend to talk more about the collective intelligence, right? This sort of, um, field of intelligence that people can can come into in the we space and and access. Um, so everyone's coming from different perspectives and and different experiences of that. But in our groups, there we have had a lot of experiences of sort of this reality of of pretty pretty amazing experiences. Can you give me an example? One sure. or two stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. Um, <clears throat> So the first one I'll give is, you know, we had a group and um, so we enter into this listening to God period and, and everyone's still kind of learning with this and you're sitting and you're, you know, you're present with one another. You can really feel the energy field and your heart is activated. So that's a big thing. It's when, when these things are emerging from an activated heart, it's very different than when we're just oh, imagining. But um, someone was, was there and they, and they said, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting a picture of just this, this really beautiful pink rose and it's and it's really fragrant and I don't know what that is right and so someone says oh I know what that is my garden right now so this person was in California the other person was in DC in my garden right now there's this rose and said the name of it and it's blooming right now it's right in the center of my garden it's my favorite flower and it has this really fragrant smell to it and that rose to me is always a symbol of of new life and creation um, and, and, you know, it's just, just one little example of those experiences that, um, the more you have those, the more you, you see like, okay, there's something real here, right? There's some, something that we're tapping into some spiritual reality, some quantum reality, if you want to put it in that language that, that we can see things, um, 
and that's more kind of what you might call the psychic side of it. Um, in, in, in other experiences, people, uh, people hear words from, from their spiritual guides, from Jesus, and, and those words are, are always about comfort, strength, and encouragement. There's no coercion. There's no, you need to do this. God told me this, right? That, that's the manipulative. That's the bad side that, that people can abuse. Um, but words come with, with comfort and strength. Uh, there, was, there was another group experience where, you know, we're sharing this beautiful time and everyone's kind of um, sharing some things and it, and it had this real wonderful element of joy to it and, and, um, and beauty. And then, um, you know, I felt, I felt from, from Jesus, just this kind of sadness, like this, this real, this real feeling of sadness that didn't fit with the group at all. And I was, I was like, kind of nervous. I was like, Oh, I don't want to say this, but <laughs> we're venturing out into exploration and, and, exp you know, trying to uh, be creative and experiment. And, uh, and I said, you know, and I, and I, I felt it that it was for this person. And I said, um, this person's name, like, you know, I'm feeling this, this real feeling of sadness. And um, it, it, I get I really just get the sense that it's, it's not yours. It's not your sadness, but you're holding it and you're holding it for someone else. And, um, and she just kind of her whole demeanor changed and she shared an experience that she had the week before that was really difficult. And she was holding this person's sadness. So, you know, there's a lot of experiences like that. And, and I know from the outside that can sound a little woo woo or a little frou frou, but, um, but it is really powerful and it is really encouraging and comforting. And, and then if, you know, if we want to take it back to the second person presence, um, you know, that people experience Jesus in their own way in a lot of different ways. And, um, you can, you can have words, but a lot of times it's just a presence. It's just a feeling of, of Jesus being with you and, and comforting you or giving you strength or, um, or nurturing you in a way that, that, that a lot of people don't have in their lives with anyone, right? <laughs> with, and, and, uh, and that can be a really beautiful experience. Um, and I think there are ways to do that, that are evolved, that are, um, you know, intellectually viable that we can accept and not, not kind of reject out of, out of some of the objections that might come up in our minds from our, our more sort of modern scientific worldview. For me, that is mainly in, in nature, the beauty of nature, when I feel he held. Yeah. You know, that's the way I feel the presence of something which is more. Yeah, and now let's go to the first person. Yeah, first. <laughs> and that connects to nature in some sense, right? Depending on how, how far you want to take it. Um, but the first person is the God within us, the God that is... Um, that is within our own um, personhood and materiality, right? Some people maybe only want to hold that to humanity. Some people take that to God within all things, the universal Christ or um, the God in matter, as Teilhard de Chardin says. Um, and that is the first person experience, the I, the, the divine, the God within. Um, and we, we connect that with our gut space, with our, our sense of deep knowing and intuition and um, and so when we move into that space in the meditative experience, um, we're connected to our divine identity that we have the nature of God within us, and our true self is rooted and grounded in that in that ground of being, in that um, in that divine love. Um, so that that's sort of the personal owning, and and that you know we get we get a lot of that message from other religions and also in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, but Western Christianity has had a real difficulty with that um, more more recently. So so that one can also be a bit of a jump for people as well. Yeah, it's a completely new approach now because uh, our churches normally were in third person talking about uh, and not b being. Oh, that's egocentric when you think you are be you are somebody or you are not or something like that. No? Mm -hmm. So uh, now you have, have created this network and can you tell me a little bit how that is working uh, practically, how you organize that and then we come over to, to my request to do something in, in Europe like that. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, let me let me start because uh, before I do that, I want to go back to the first person for one more thing because that's really crucial. You know, when I talk about second person and I talk about these experiences in the subtle mystical realm, and and we can read about those in the Bible and read about those in other parts of the world, and it can sound kind of crazy or psychic or whatever, but actually rooting and grounding in that first person identity in God is such a huge part of that because when we're coming from that place of true self we're able to speak without clinging without looking for needs of affirmation without some of those other ways that we maybe go out amongst one another and and community is messy and I think that's why sometimes a lot of spiritual groups avoid it um, but it also then creates this loneliness that we were talking about earlier so recognizing that first person face of God is so vital to practice and to root into and ground into as we move out into the community experience in the second person with one another and with, with the divine, um, because it, it really just, it, it grounds us in that perspective and in that experience. So I, I just wanted to add that. And that, and that does connect into the networking piece when, when um, well, sorry, no, the co-creating piece where we, um, where we are speaking these things and we think, oh, that's just your imagination or that's just coming from you or is that coming from spirit? Well, God is within us, right? So what we're speaking also has a nature of the divine to it and, and, and it's the co-creation. It's us and, and, and the, the other faces of God. So um, that's just a little more on that that I think can be also helpful for people to understand. Um, <clears throat> then to your question, the networking piece. Uh, uh, that is that is difficult, you know. How do we find people? How do we connect? The internet connects everyone, but it's also this vast, sprawling flatland, right? The internet is not created with integral tiers, so <laughs> um, so so it it can be difficult to network. It can be difficult to find people. You know, you, you find these kind of groupings of of where people are, and you and you connect, and then it spider webs out, and that that's a mesh network. That's that's more an integral thing that I think. Um, is how it should be anyway. Um, a, lo a lot of what that's looked like in the past has been through thought leaders, right? You know, a thought leader emerges and, and people come up around them because they like their ideas and then that's sort of an audience. And you can, you know, connect with that audience, but it's all oriented around toward the thought leader or maybe a, a more of a, of a modern Western guru <laughs> model, right? Um, and, and that's good. It has its purposes. It has its values, of course. Um, but I also think we we need to transcend that that model of of putting it all on a thought leader and 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 those organizations tend to form or, you know to form around with different values um, than maybe an organization that that's trying to start from a place of community that's trying to connect through uh, through kind of a networking and valuing each person's voice and experience. So it, it's not easy, it's difficult, but, but it, it, it's kind of that work of just connecting people, finding people in these different, you know, whether that's internet forums and integral life, which is a very natural place. Of course, you'd find integral people there, but um, other places too, you know, Facebook groups and Facebook certainly has its positives and negatives. Um, but beyond that, I am, I am not a, a marketing expert <laughs> as much as a networking person. So, so that's a good question, right? How do we find people? How do we connect with one another, especially when, when people are kind of, you know, it's not going to happen through the institutions, um, and, and people, you know, people are scattered and they have their different points of connection into the internet. And, and I guess it's sort of finding some more of those spaces on the internet of, of how we can connect with people and, and just allowing that that takes time, that there's a patience to that, that, um, that it's, it's not like a, you can't just put up a TV commercial or something that a million people are going to see or <laughs> you wouldn't want that anyway. So. Yeah. But you have already created some groups. They are already working. So can you tell us a little bit about the, how it works and the experience? Yeah, so so right now we're starting with those we space groups, and that that's kind of the entry point. Um, you know, sometimes the networking happens first, and then you have the communities of practice. Um, the practice itself, and and people seeking that, I think, has become our gathering point, has become our our connection point. Where, oh, I can you know I can come be a part of this group. Um, we tried to do uh, some more or just. Uh, open forum space for networking using Slack, and um, and that just just kind of didn't really work. Um, you know, I didn't want to use 
Facebook because it, it doesn't really facilitate communication or dialogue. Uh, and, and so I tried to use a different platform and, and it's really hard to get people to, to go to somewhere on the internet that they don't usually go. And technology is still a barrier for a lot of people um, and just understanding how to use new technology. So, so we do face definitely some uphill climbs and, and, um, and the, that kind of idea of having a network of innovators who can who can collaborate and support one another in the work of evolving Christianity is still very much at the heart of what we're trying to do here. Um, but we're finding that that the the best point of entry at this point is these practice groups, and I think that's ties into the loneliness. That ties into the the desire for people to have community and people that they can share experience with, and then that can lead into more discussion and more um, you know more working together and collaborating and, and kind of see where that goes. But I do like that we're starting with experience. We're starting with, with these groups together, these forms of community that are experiential focus. So these are not primarily discussion groups. We do talk about each other's lives and we do talk, but we, we, we're trying to, to also integrate not just the cognitive, not just the verbal, but, but spiritual experience and actually waking up in Christian forms. Yeah, uh, my experience is when we are able to come together on video as we do now, and as these groups are working, that's precious. You know, whenever you write text, it's sort of, yeah, but not really, you know? But so you meet in person, almost in person, but the experience, my experience is when I meet in person, then the people with whom I had the contact in video, it's like as if you know, forever you know so it is a big 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 possibility to to really create community uh, and i i appreciate that that was also why i'm attracted to it <laughs> because i love video i love to meet people in video you you must know that i live in a beautiful house which is called paradiso integrale where i also accept guests or little groups and so but when there is nobody here i'm sort of alone and around me the hey people I lost you for a second. Uh, okay. I said I'm I'm alone around me in the countryside, you know, and people around me are, you know, in even in purple when we use spiral dynamics and red and blue, but integral I have some friends who some of them arrive in green, but the topics which I really like to talk about it's really difficult. And so for me, for being nurtured, I need contact with people like you on, and be able to see them, not just telephone. Telephone is nice too, but it's no, para, um, no uh, comparison with seeing each other, seeing the expression and everything. So I'm really attracted to that. And I, as you know, I would like to participate in, in these groups. The problem is that they are mainly America based, no? And we have this time zone difference. So the question is, if we could find people, Europe and Australia could go well together, you know, because Australia in the evening and we in the morning, so we could come together. Uh, so the question is, where do, where do we find these people? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's the question. And I, you know, I, I would love that. We do have some people who are on our mailing list and who follow the, the we also do weekly writings every Sunday. Um, and we do have people who follow that, some people from Australia and a handful of people from Europe. And then, you know, it's those few people and then finding schedules that work and connecting them. So yeah, you and I, we're working on that right now and, and we'd love for more people to join. So if, if that's something that sounds engaging to you, yeah. Yeah, sign up. With so for that, I would like to have a little bit more of an insight how the groups work then. You certainly cannot be there when we do it in the mornings because you sleep. So is it self-organized? Do we find uh, practices for ourselves and, and do that? Or how, how is the concept of these groups? Yeah, and that'll take some, some reimagining. And, and this is, you know, we're, we're new. Like we just started in January. And, and one of our deepest values is creativity and another one's evolution. So we recognize that, that these are new things that we're trying, right? We're, 
these are evolving forms and so we don't have it figured out and this is hasn't really been done before you know <laughs> people gathering in these ways online is is totally new right the technology wasn't even there five years ago and on, on that piece I will say you know you were talking about zoom and and seeing people face to face and relating and um, even though there's kind of like a Brady Bunch effect, the, the the actual experience of doing the practice together in the energetic field, it's not deterred by time, by space and time, right? The quantum physicists say that, right? We we have this connection that that I can we can feel that on Zoom. So that's you know, if anyone has concerns about that, don't worry because it's it's real. We don't need VR yet. That'll come. But uh, <laughs> um, so so what we've done so far with the groups is, you know, Paul and I have been present with them to model and to teach and to and to, you know, facilitate for the first three sessions. And then we hand it over. We want the groups to take ownership of themselves and to we rotate facilitatorship. And um, we really do that because we want empowerment. We want we want the groups to um, to not rely on us, to not follow the thought leader model or the, you know, the, facilitation and, and, you know, growth hierarchy is good, but um, we also need to just empower everyone in those groups. So that's how we've done it with the American groups. Um, you know, if we get a European group, I, I, I just love that so much. I would love to have the international group and, and I'm, you know, I, I can do some odd hours a few times, or we can set up other times to do some, some practical uh, experience, you know, and even if we had to split that, we're half the group, you know, we do it with the Australians this time, we do it with the Europeans this time, however that needs to look, um, because it is something that's probably best modeled to some extent first. We do write about it, but it's very different than when you experience it, and because uh, it is a new practice for a lot of people, even, you know, parts of it, right? Some of it people are more familiar with or might have more comfort in, um, or maybe not, right? Because, because again, we're trying to integrate all of these three faces, you know, our, our mind, our, our heart, and our gut. And, and that's, you know, most spiritual practices that people do engage with, with probably one, maybe two at, at most, and, and in its own way. So, so again, that I think that the value of modeling that, of being present, of showing it is, is very important. So we, we, can, we can jump that, those logistical hurdles, right? We find ways, we get creative. Uh, Paul also sleeps kind of odd hours. So, so if, you know, if people are interested, I don't want that to be a deterrent. Like we'll, we'll figure it out and that's how we, you know, how things can emerge. <laughs> yeah, now I have another question. Um, because we are in integral, we don't have to reject blue. And, uh, and rules. So my question is, how uh, do you ask a commitment to certain ways of being together before people come? Uh, or do you also give the authority to, to, to talk about it if there are people who are not behaving in, a, in the right m way, you know, because it happened to me several times in, when I did groups like that, that um, some people are coming for different reasons than they uh, pretend to come, you know, into these groups. So how do you uh, handle these? Do you have a concept uh, or is it every group has to figure that out by themselves or mm -hmm. how is that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, right now we've started with kind of loose guidelines of no fixing, no saving, no setting each other straight. And those are from Parker Palmer and, and groups that he's done work, work in that area. So that's a real basic guideline. Um, we do try to have, um, try to meet people before we go straight into the group. Um, sometimes not always we're able to do that. Um, and, and that's just one of the tricky parts of the internet, right, is uh, people are coming from everywhere, which gives us this beautiful, wonderful gift of accessibility, but it also gives us, um, yeah, some of those challenges that, that you talked about. So, um, you know, the, the other gift of the internet, if I can be a little uh, jokester at the moment, is, you know, if someone is is really violating, they're here for a different reason, you can just kick them out, you know, and they're gone. Their video's gone. Not like a church where if they're there, they're there, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I do say that a little tongue in cheek. But also, I mean, in reality, yeah, right, we're here. And that that even in some ways maybe ties into the the Christian part, right? We're we're naming Christianity as as a common language, as a common experience, and and that doesn't mean you have to be Christian 
you know, whatever that means to you to come to be a part of this group, these groups. But that means that you want to enter into this Christian form of practice, this this experience in a way that, that we're naming it from a Christian perspective. Just like if I would go to a, a Buddhist Sangha, like I would practice the Buddhist practice, I wouldn't do, you know, bring in my own thing. So, um, so that's why we have that sort of exclusivity for a purpose. And exclusivity is not even the right word, but, but kind of the focus, right? Um, and so when we do encounter people, and, and honestly, we haven't yet, <laughs> we haven't had any issues with that yet. And, and some of that might be that the nature and the dynamic of the practice is, is more energetic, is more, uh, it's less um, debate, you're not getting into arguments, and so people are attacking or, or anything like that. And th that might happen in the future as we evolve into to more forms than just this kind of we space prayer practice. Um, so, so that is a good word. That is something that we're cognizant of. And, um, and yeah, like you said, we don't have to reject all of blue, right? We can have sort of a healthy, healthy rules and guidelines and structures. Um, so that, that's what we have currently. And, and again, we, we try to follow the model of, um, of less boundary setting and more center of attraction. So our center of attraction that, that we want people to be drawn to is that experiencing and practicing the three faces of God, that collective integral evolved form of Christianity. And if there are people who are more further out on the margin of that, and they're here for other reasons and doing different things, then, you know, it starts with a conversation. And I, I'm very, I'm very much emphasized and, and personally value like that, that connectivity piece. And that's also another gift of the internet. I can say, hey, let's schedule a Zoom conference and let's talk about this. And you know, why are you here? What is this doing for you? And and decide if that's something that 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 there just needs to be a shift. And and you know, and and that can be the case with a lot of people, right? We don't maybe our social skills aren't quite as built up as they they used to be because of some of this loneliness and these different experiences, or we don't know how to do collective spiritual practice. So we just need to talk about it. We need to learn. We need to be um, be helped in that. So if people have good intentions and they're there with, with a good heart, then, you know, I think we can make it work. Um, so that, that's my approach to it. Yeah. Thank you. And you, um, hinted to that you might also expand this at the moment is practice, practice, but what I would also be interesting to explore these um, psycho psychological dimension of, of the Bible to reread um, pieces of the Bible because I really never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to, to try to understand it from the perspective where we have today, you know, and I would uh, appreciate also that. So the question is, do you also maybe once a month or so offer a discussion group on certain mm -hmm. passages or certain topics? Yeah, at this point, we we have not done anything like that. We're we're probably just going to start beginning a monthly meeting where we discuss the writings that we're doing that that Paul and I do every Sunday, and those are writings about the practice, about um, not always specific to the practice, but but different things within an evolved Christian perspective. Um, I wrote a series on Teilhard de Chardin, and Paul's been writing about the whole body practice recently, and and people want to talk about that. Um, and so we're trying to create more spaces for that, uh, two barriers. Well, the first, the first is that, um, you know, we're also, again, this is new. We're trying to discover it and, and, um, you know, people, people are used to paying for certain things, right? <laughs> and we're not used to paying for community or for gathering. We're used to paying the speaker or whatever. And, and that's just part of evolution, right? Is what, how do we do this in a, in a financially sustainable and viable way, right? Um, so we're a nonprofit, you know, we take support and donations, but it, you know, that takes time to grow and, 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 you know, that's a, a tough ask in some ways, you know, we're still trying to figure that out. So I, I have another job. <laughs> I have to work to pay the bills. I have two little kids. So some of that is just, just time and an opportunity. So, um, so that takes time for, you know, as the financial builds up and then, then there's more that we can do, there's more that we can offer. So, so that's one limitation that, that I personally face. Um, Paul is retired, but he's also 82 and, um, you know, has limitations on his energy and, and whatnot. Um, but if I could, I would love to offer as much as possible. <laughs> uh, when we talk about the Bible, um, you know, that's something just personally that I have, that I am still trying to recover from, from damage and allergies. You know, I grew up 
fundamentalist and Bible school, Christian school. I got so much Bible. I got hit on the head with the Bible so much. And, and there's really beautiful, good things in that. And I have come to the point, right, of course, where I can, I can appreciate that. But, um, but it can be really difficult for me to enter back into some of those texts. Um, I know that's not the experience for everyone. And I, and I do think language is a huge part of that. I'm a writer and, and uh, you know, we need to, we need to, I would love to see new, there's some groups out there doing a little bit of that, maybe not from an integral perspective, but trying to shift some of the language um, and the ways that it was translated into very kind of red power language or things like that, where we can, you know, the same thing of power, we could say energy, and that has a really different connotation that we connect with. So that is something that, that I would love to see and, and I think could probably wade into um, myself. I, uh, Paul would probably be much better at leading that than I would, <laughs> or you or, or other people, right? So, so that's something that as the network grows, again, we don't want to be a thought leader model. We don't want to be overly hierarchical. We want to, we want to raise up. And as the network grows, and if there's someone who's in the network and is loving this and is saying, hey, I want to, I want to facilitate this, um, then, then that would be wonderful. So those are the kind of things that, that emerge when we, when we give space for people and their passions and when we, um, when we really empower people to do that and to take ownership of, of what they care about. Yeah, that is wonderful. So uh, the invitation is to people to connect with you. How do they do that? Yeah, so our website is integralchristiannetwork.org. Um, and you can go there and look around. Um, if you want to you know, connect with me, you can email admin at integralchristiannetwork.com. So that's a little different. We actually, the website is .org or .com, but our mm -hmm. email is um, So you can, yeah, you can contact me that way. There's also um, enrollment forms on the website. You can sign up for a WeSpace group and there's time slots that you can, we're enrolling for the fall now for groups that will start in September. Um, and then there's also a mailing list that you can join to, to hear about, um, to get the weekly writings and then also to hear about future events. We wanna have, try to have local gatherings at some point in the future and, and other things that are happening online as well. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. So it's the invitation, connect with him. And I'm doing uh, chat groups too, some in English, but uh, also more and more in German and women's group uh, groups also where we lately <laughs> explored the topic, uh, the soul and how the soul can go and many of these, not only spiritual topics, but uh, we do it publicly so everybody can afterwards uh, read, uh, listen to, or watch the videos. Um, but these gatherings which you are propose, they are not public, are they? The, are they recorded? Yeah, they are not public. Our WeSpace groups are not recorded. They're not public. Um, so far, at this point, the monthly meetings that we're going to start doing are for WeSpace group participants. Um, at some point in the future, I'd love to have other gatherings that are open to the broader public, um, mm -hmm. but not at the moment, right? Okay, because it's also a little bit a delicate topic, no? When people need to open up, uh, <clears throat> and instead what we do in the wisdomfactory.net is talking more about all sorts of integral topics and give people the opportunity. We talk very much about our own experience with all these topics, you know, give people the opportunity to find out, ah, that's something I experienced too, or something. So I give people the possibility to, 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 to get inspiration by what uh, we share uh, of our experiences. So maybe in a, in a future time, we can do that too, <laughs> even with the spiritual topics. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, and that's really beautiful. And I, and I want to say to that, that, um, you know, there's also a, maybe a, an, an orange dynamic that, that organizations can sometimes have where we're doing this and we're doing that. And, and you know, people, people can maybe see each other as competitors and that's not at all at all our spirit or what we want to have right if you're having these dis discussion groups like hey that's let's do that you know we're all doing different works there's other organizations that I've been connecting with around the US and and we need to change our attitude to so much more around collaboration and say okay how are we collaborating how is how is what you're doing how can that support what we're doing and how is what we're doing can support what you're doing and, and that's the networking and connecting and exactly and, trying to do it all in one space or under one banner. 
So yeah. Exactly. And by inviting you, I want to collaborate and hope that people uh, find out about you and get interested. Not about you personally, maybe too, but I mean about what you are doing and what you are trying to, to create. And yeah, I thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. It's also for me was more informative about what, uh, what will be my experience when we succeed to get the group together in this time zone. So thank you very much. And people, connect with us. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure. Great conversation. Yeah, thank you.